is the whole key. It has to be a whole cultural thing that has to get cleaned up. And most of all, where the adult activities come in is our, willing to ex our willingness to exemplify what we truly believe. You know what I mean? So, I mean, I've had, uh, you know, I, I, could, I had, had husbands come in that have basically worked on these jobs. They've hated, hated for 35, 40 years. And their thing is, is that, you know, well, what do you want? This is a response to the kids. Well, what do you want? You had food to eat, a place to stay, and clothes to wear. You know, and they're just so pissed off and angry because they felt that for them to actually hold up their own perception of their own dignity, that they were lassoed and locked in to having to perform this act. It's like, don't even ask me about going nowhere with you as the wife. I ain't interested in hugging you or nothing else because I'm just pissed off because I had to work here for 30-some years. So their attitude is, it's like, did you have to work? I mean, I've seen this go on in my office, this dialogue. I'm just sitting here watching this. It's like, did you have to work? You don't have to worry about nothing. You got my retirement check. So like, shut up. No, I don't want to go to church with you or whatever. So she's pissed off. She's pissed off because her thing is that you just left me here with the children. So I had to deal with their issues for 30 some years. And you know, I couldn't confer with you about nothing because you didn't want to hear it because all you want to do is go to bed so you can get up and go to the job. Do you understand what I'm saying? So it's like, woo, like this is like really interesting. You know, so it's like now, how do we heal the family? Because the family is ill. You know what I mean? So we have one, we, you know, we have one symptom here. We, you know, we've got one symptom here that is exhibited physically by this man, okay? But everybody else is ill, you know? And I mean, I mean, it's just been incredible because, you know, the son has come in with this one family I'm talking about, and his thing is that he just had to sit down now. He's in his 30s and tell his father that the only thing that he can remember about him in his childhood was having to basically go make sure that he and his mother could get their check on Friday. Because this man worked every day, but he drank. So the big thing for him was to make sure that on Fridays that he accompanied his mother to make sure that they got the check before the daddy cashed it and drank it up. Now this is a man 30 years old telling his dad, now this is my relationship with you. This is how I see it. You understand? So now, is this man who's 30 years old going to be able to have a healthy relationship with his kids? Well, the answer is yes. If he can get some support and help. <laughs> right, and, and get some other things happening. Oh, you understand what I'm saying? And it was interesting because he was loving enough to recognize that his delivery of this was not in anger, but he did want his dad to be real clear about the fact that the idea that he felt loved because he had a place to stay and food to eat and clothes to wear was not important to him because as far as he's concerned, that had nothing to do with love. Okay, but see, you have to understand, and this is a whole thing that I deal with when we start dealing with sexuality, is that there's something known as love strategies. And you cannot come and shove me something in my face that somebody else told you was important for their, them to feel loved and think that I'm supposed to basically be happy and glad about it. Because I have my own references that I've come with from my own imprinting, from my own family, to determine for me what my love strategy is. And I've just seen this whole thing break down in just even couples. His thing is that I gave her a fur coat and a this and a that and a whole bunch of other stuff, and she's still up here asking me, do I love her? Well, of course I do. Why does she think I give her that? And her thing is like, what is he, a fool? I can get my own coat and whatever else is that. <laughs> I want to know why is it that we can't have a decent conversation. Right. Right. I want to know why we just can't be off holding hands or something, why we just can't go for a walk. That's what she wants to know because her love strategy is that if you just will stop your stuff and just spend some time with me, then I'm love. All this other stuff is really not important. So he's trying to push off a value system. Okay. All right. They just want to change the tape. But, you know, but I'm saying he's trying to push off a value system, but perhaps that was his mama's or aunt's or somebody, or some other girlfriend he might have had. But, so I'm just saying this whole communication issue we do not come to each other and just basically ask what you need. And most of all, be willing to let people realize if we give it to them and they really then figure out, oh, I thought that's what I needed and I didn't, that that's okay. Because then we have situations where I've been in counseling where the person said, well, hell, this is what she asked for, I gave it to her. And that ain't so that's why being able to be flexible and mobile, et cetera, allows you to know that, okay, well, we got to turn right now. So, I mean, let's just go ahead and turn right and see what that gets us. 
But you've got to be able to stay flexible on the physical level because that's the representation that you're flexible mentally so that you can go ahead and change. And when you understand that you have a whole infinite That doesn't make sense to me. It's my belief that by doing what you're saying to over generations that you would change that, and you alluded to that earlier, I believe. Is it your opinion that over so many generations, and how many would it take to say, uh, to get, it takes seven? to get rid of the predisposition to cancer and all that stuff? Right, well see, first of all, you have to understand that, unfortunately, too many people lie. I mean, it's just an outright lie that nothing changes. And any geneticist that will say that is lying to you. Now, what they can tell you is that in their <coughs> repertoire information, they don't know that it changes, mm -hmm. which is totally different than sitting up telling you that nothing changes. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? So I'm saying that we know that that is not true. Your, everything has a turnover time, a half-life. Everything changes. So as I said, the, my data says that to inbreed in a permanent attribute or to inbreed out a previously permanent attribute that you don't want takes seven generations. Now when you then look at what is that timing, that timing is relative to the organism that we're talking about. Okay, generational time for Africans is 15 years because we are adults at age 15. So that is considered really one generation for us. Because if we are raised properly, we have the capacity to reproduce ourselves and move on with our next family. And in Africa, we do live that way. That's when I began to realize that all this stuff I was taught, a whole bunch of it was really jumbled up. Because it blew my mind the first time I met a 14-year-old businesswoman, mother, okay, and wife. And my thing is, I like, well, wow, this is deep, because she truly is not a child, so we can forget that, okay? And obviously, she is actually able to throw down and do things that I've seen folks 60 can't capable of doing yet. So, I, I mean, I was just really in cultural shock the first time I went to Africa, and I was meeting these people that were doing all these things. So it was interesting, too, because, you know, and I, I really appreciate my experiences because the universe really set me up to really see a whole panorama because I was the only African that went with a group of other nine other doctors that were white. And it was, like, really interesting checking out their response to this because the white girls was actually talking about, oh, my God, how terrible that is. This poor young girl that sat on with her husband like this and a business and these kids, and she hasn't had a chance to live or go to college or anything. <laughs> you know, so I'm like... Looking at that over there, listening to this, you know, and then I'm looking at this sister over here that is running a business. You, you understand what I'm saying? I didn't have figured out that, how to do that yet. At that time, I hadn't had my business. I was still being employed. Do you understand what I'm saying? That she's dealing with her husband. I'm already looking at two failed marriages for me. Do you understand what I'm saying? And she's also dealing with her kids. And she's like 14 years old. You know, and the driver of my truck was 18 years old. He had three wives. You know, and I was like, wow, and I like this is really interesting, you know, because my thing is that most 18-year-olds I know are totally dysfunctional. 14 years old and they haven't even figured out they're on the planet. <laughs> so I'm like, well, how does a 14-year-old have this kind of responsibility, and how do we have a man who's 18 years old who realizes, and very, he told me all about his kids, how proud he was of his kids and his wives and everything, and he was driving and hustling and doing everything he could because he had to meet these responsibilities that he took upon himself to have. So I'm like, wow, I mean, this is like, I was just blown away. I just had to really just remove myself for a whole day and just actually process all the stuff that was being downloaded because it was totally alien to my whole reference of people living, existing, being able to function, etc. So I mean that just totally opened me up to the fact that I had to look at from where I'm coming and look at what we're doing with our own capacity because these people have far less to work with but we're moving with it. So I'm saying that you know as I begin to read the information I mean you know at the University of Michigan MIT, etc. Yes, the African male and female is completely mature by age 14 to 15 years old, and they've documented that. 
So then that answered questions for me about why we have such high rates of what they call teenage pregnancies, which is not teenage, it's adult pregnancies for us, okay, and also a lot of crime in our, what they call teenagers, because we haven't given them information to deal with an adult when body. African come in this country and educated in this system, becomes retarded like this system. <laughs> becomes retarded like the system. So we have teenagers, 14, 15, 16, having babies that are not, a, not the kind of adults that you're talking about. Right, but it's because we've created an anachronism. So we have people with these kind of bodies that are operating in a whole different space and time because of our ignorance of who we're raising. So now we really understand the importance of rites of passage, which is now we understand why they got taken off at seven or eight years old and were taken out of the villages and things and went through a whole bunch of stuff. So that by the time they figured out how to hunt or whatever they were going to do, et cetera, and they had to prove themselves, and then they had to come back and demonstrate to the community that they were ready to take their place, then that's why they had marriage rights and a whole bunch of other stuff. Because we didn't have no social services and folks begging and all that kind of stuff in Africa. We did a whole bunch of other stuff. We didn't have no business. But that, no, we didn't have to deal with. Okay, but they understood the importance of it. They at least understood who they were and they understood the capacity that they had and they were willing to download the information. You know, it was interesting, just last year I was at a conference at U of M and they were talking about stress urinary incontinence. And so the European doctor gets up and talks about bladder control and function and he talks about the fact that in Africa, he couldn't believe it, but he saw with his own eyes that the children are able to be trained at six months, totally trained at six months old. He said he couldn't even believe it was incredible. So he took pictures of the whole procedures to how the African mothers train the babies to be potty trained at six months. I mean, it was like I loved it because then that answered to me why they was going around with no diapers. Because I could not understand how come there wasn't feces and urine running down these women's sides. But these babies were potty trained at six years old, so they didn't need no diapers and things. I mean, six months old. So they didn't need any diapers. And then he went on to say that we cannot do that that we are not neurologically capable of controlling our bladders until we are two years old. Yeah. Now, so therefore, now what does that say to you as an African mother? Right. Now, you have a child that you have sent already into retardation mm -hmm. because he has complete neurologic control at six months and you're up here not training him and awakening up those centers in his brain, et cetera, until he's two years old. And unfortunately, black families to take, a, be a, take the white families as a model and then people want to have their children be like white children. Well, I mean, this is the whole legacy that we're looking at. It comes from what? Lack of gratitude. Lack of knowledge about who you are. Yeah, but see, even if you appreciated who you are, I think that you would be willing to want to get up on the information because you would obviously see that there was a difference. Mm -hmm. And so I'm saying that the lack of information is just another symptom of the real crime of lack of appreciation of self. Okay, and there are deeper symptoms of, of that. Do you understand what I'm saying? So it's like when you truly love yourself, there, there's a point that you get to that you just basically have to dismiss stuff. You might not have the information, but you intuitively know it's wrong and you will not do it for you. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, ma'am. Uh, when you were discussing the uh, African woman who had a child of 14, is that one of the things that creates the cultural damage for women who have this well, no, but it does go into uh, issues, again, with genetic encoding, okay, because, like, the axiology or the value system is different. And, again, when you try to now actualize a foreign value system that is chemically alien, okay, to the chemistry that you already have on board, okay, you create problems. Because, see, there's something I didn't tell you about and you need to understand that so you can understand what's happening. And this was phenomenal. But there's something known, oh, good, it's right up here. There's something known as morphic resonance. Uh, what they call causative, <coughs> no, it's called formative causation. Okay, so Rupert Sheldrake uses the term uh, formative causation and morphic resonance is used by Fred Allen Wolf. But these are two integral physicists. 
And what they talk about is the fact that, and it goes back to our electromagnetic spectrum. They were very curious about why is it that when we see flocks of birds or schools of fish, that they automatically know how to turn left or right and not crash into each other. But to their visual perception, they're not talking, as they understand talking. Okay, there's no sign that they send out that says turn left or turn right. There's no arrow out there, you know, and they just are doing all this and nobody's crashing in anybody else. Okay. So it's like, you know, why are they all landing or going up or down at the same time? And they're like, well, you know, we have to find this. So it's kind of like the, you know, Newton's apple story. And so they did some interesting observations. And so in Australia, you know, they have an area called the outback. And it's like really interesting because nature uh, manicures that area by setting it on fire. And so when things get out of hand, then nature sets itself on fire, the brush, and it burns 100,000 acres and that dies out and then it recolonizes itself. So in the outback, they have these huge bush fires, but what happens is it causes the animals to have to then do migration. Okay, so these animals, because of this one uh, vast bushfire, these little birds called tits, T-I-T-S, were forced into the cities. And so what happened is, is that this one area, because the normal plants and insects and things that they normally eat obviously were destroyed or had to move on because of the fires, a bird figured out how to open a milk bottle and suck the milk out. So they thought that was very interesting because after one week, all the birds were attacking the milk bottles and sucking it out. <laughs> and then they started actually logging in the times and the sightings over Australia as to when all the birds of the same species started doing the same thing. So these are little teeny weeny birds, like little finches, you know, and they don't fly for very, very long distances. So it was like, how is it a thousand miles away within five months, the same species of bird now is actually opening milk bottles in this area? It was the same entity with the fish. How do they know how to turn right and left, et cetera? And especially now, since we know that these birds are not communicating, not a thousand miles away. There's a particular uh, moth, for example, that grows in South America. A huge thing, it's about big as my palm of my hand and it has to fly over a thousand miles to mate. So it's an interesting mating cycle because the females go and they lay the eggs way, way away and then they have to actually fly back to this one bush to mate. <laughs> and it's really interesting that they don't mess with any other species of animal, a butterfly, a moth, whatever it is, etc. And at this time of year, they all fly back to this one bush and it's the only bush that they mate on. So the women get there first, the females, and then the men come and they mate. And their thing is that we don't understand this because it's like, well, what makes the men get here first? I mean, the men get here. You know, is it some kind of aroma that the women sent out? And it's how do they smell it for a thousand miles? You know, these are the questions that they ask. Well, what they figured out is, is that there is a frequency of sound, which is a form of light, or something that basically we can't pick up with our ears, eyes, nose, etc that these animals are able to communicate with each other just because they have the same like structure. So wherever they are on the planet, they can communicate with themselves and exchange information. So they call it the hundredth monkey theory is the common name for it. Hundredth monkey theory. So if you pay attention, we see that in ourselves because we have sisters and brothers here who dress in culture. They know how to play the drums. They can put the gaileys on. I mean, they got all the language and the names and whatever else. And it's like, well, you know, when have you been home? Never. Never been to Africa. <laughs> Never, ever been to Africa. And we know that there are no books that's going to teach you drumming and all this other stuff. So it's like, now how are you, you know, Miss Africa of 1993 and you've never been home? <laughs> how is this? The same thing. Because all of the sisters and brothers who have the same genetic makeup as ourselves, when they are willing to actually live out the information that is inculcated in their genes, it's like radar that's sent out so that whoever else has the same gene structure, their genes are automatically activated. So that means then that wherever my sisters and brothers are on the planet, 
I will always have a natural innate tendency to act out whatever they are doing unless I consciously inhibit myself. And that's how we then start getting into diseases. And it also works the opposite way, which is why, you know, the system brothers over there are acting crazy because we're now radiating this stuff over here. And they're picking it up in their gene pool and acting it out. And it is called morphic resonance. So anything that is like me automatically is going to basically be informed and if they allow themselves to, will spontaneously act out my behavior. And it is a chemical reality. So my thoughts can activate somebody else's genes to make them act and think in the same way without me being there just because they are like me. Yes. Well, you have to stop it. That's what I'm saying. The, the parent, by them controlling their behavior, automatically dictates and sets the tone for the offspring. But well, where's the word in, the N word going to? And we constantly manifest the word the N word. I don't like saying that anymore. And I remember saying it now, but the N word is a, a derogative statement as the people as the people. And here I keep saying that N word is the language. Okay. Well, I mean, you know, whatever the definition is that you've given to it is actually what you continue to stimulate in the thoughts in the right brain. It becomes subconscious. When who? Oh, yeah, right. I mean, it has to be basically something that you then have to, just like a habit, check it every time it happens until it no longer becomes an automatic response and that they now are checking it themselves. I mean, what I'm wondering, because I, I've been on the bus sometimes, or a ride, and you, you get that feeling, this guy is all the way on the next car, and you hear him, and you, you can almost sometimes feel the intensity of that. Right, but I'm just saying this is a whole cultural cleansing that has to happen for us to create the picture of the kind of life that we say we want to live. You know, it has to be, it's, it's not anything that lies on anybody. So if we haven't learned that from Malcolm or King or Garvey, we better learn it. Okay, that this is not a one-person issue here. Okay, is that everybody is a leader. Okay, and that they are expected to lead when it's appropriate. So if that means that's in your home or in your job or in your church or whatever, then you are supposed to take on the role. And see, this is what we haven't learned yet. We lay everything on one person or a group and we just wear them out. Okay, but sorry, it's over, it's not, that's not going to get it. Okay, and so that's why it's going to require us to overcome our own fears and our own insecurities to bring about what it is that we need. Because if you're telling me that you can't go to your job, basically, and uh, take a position of leadership when it's appropriate, because you know you're not going to be involved in certain things, or you have to go there and quit or whatever, then, you know, understand that as far as a collective effort goes we failed that day because it is very important that you have to hold your space I have to hold mine and everybody else for us to have this and the rationale that I got kids or I got a house note or whatever else is inexcusable because we all have the universe and see this is why we have to basically understand what our real support system is it is not the federal government and Social Security and it's not your job it's your consciousness and when you understand that, you can precipitate whatever you need out of the universe. Everybody else has. Why can't you? Do you understand what I'm saying? And so I'm saying that it's really interesting how, as far as I'm concerned, this new uh, awareness and the new evolution of our uh, slaying, what I call our inner dragons, etc., it really now becomes an inner protest, okay, that we refuse to continue to lie to ourselves, we refuse to continue to take inferior quality anything, that we refuse to actually be involved in perpetuating anything that is not in our collective best interest. 
You know, and I asked people, I said, you know, when you work for these companies, I mean, do you ask for a prospectus? I mean, you know, they're not doing you in a favor per se. I mean, this is a reciprocation. So it's like, yes, I'm asking for employment here, but I'm also asking to understand what my life force energy is going to perpetuate. So where's your prospectus? What do you stand for? What kind of investments do you have, et cetera? You know, so you might not like being involved in something that basically is exploiting your sisters and brothers in South Africa. So you understand that, you know, you just want them to tear up your application. You understand what I'm saying? You might not be interested in basically them being over in Somalia and a whole bunch of other things or that they're making missiles and warheads and whatever else. Because regardless of what you're applying for a secretary or for a custodian, your efforts make that perspective work. And see, we need to stop tripping on that, talking about we just do this. Okay, we have to understand that whatever level we're functioning in, it is making the whole collective wheel work. That's just how powerful each and every one of us are. So, you know, when we actually are supporting the demon that's cutting our head off, and we go in there every day for two pennies, you know, you have to understand why. Because you didn't even know who you were supporting. You didn't even know what you were contributing your energies to. And see, that's another level of disrespect, of disregarding your own importance. And so it's like your responsibility to know actually what you stand for. So, you know, and that's one of the main reasons why I left Henry Ford Hospital. Because when I realized that the satellite clinic that I ran for them was really for them to perpetuate pathology so they could continue to have a residency program. They never were interested in giving health care there. Residency programs re require that the applying institution to the American uh, college of residency programs, you have to be able to provide X amount of pathology to teach. You have to demonstrate that you have X amount of pathology that comes in there every year so that you can demonstrate these disorders so the folks can learn about them. So you don't have no pathology, you can't get no residence. And so many of these satellite clinics in the inner cities are just a meal to perpetuate disease so that the residents can actually see what it's like for you to have first, second, third stage syphilis, whatever it is, et cetera, and then work out the treatment. So the clinic I took over was horrendous. I was just curious to find out how could one place have so much disease. I think you tell me it's a doctor sitting up there every day, well, what are they doing? It's impossible. Because when those sisters came over there, when I was on call, I literally hated it because I knew I wasn't going to sleep that night. They never came and they just had a normal delivery or a normal process. Somebody was dead or seasoned or bleeding or whatever all of the time. And my thing is, how does this collectively just come from one place? So when I took it over, I could see how it happened because the staff person never saw patients. The med students saw the patients. So I'm like, oh, now that's real interesting. Now, when does the med student now have any clinical insight to anything? And they don't. And so my thing was that if I'm going to sign the chart off, which is how that system happened to be working, then I'm going to see the patient. So I understand that what I signed for is actually what I saw. And they didn't like that, the idea that I was going in the room introducing them as the senior med student or the junior med student, because they were tripping and playing ego and introducing themselves as the doctor. So they decided that they didn't want to come there anymore because she won't let us see the patients. And so they actually, the, the department actually let them pull out. So that just shows you how that works because they asked me not to basically have such severe supervision. But my thing is that what are they talking about? Because I have to sign off the chart. This is my license. And so my thing is that how can I let somebody who has no experience go in and see a patient? Because much of understanding disease is intuitive. I mean, when you just see a person on the next week, they look totally different. I don't care what the paper says. There is a problem here that you need to do some investigation. You understand what I'm saying? So you just cannot just say that the laboratory work is okay and the patient is looking crazy and say it's okay and not try to get some more information. But my colleagues do that all the time. People look real crazy and they say, well, there's nothing wrong with you. The lab work is fine. And you're like, well, I have, you know, nails growing out of my face, circles under my eyes, feel like hell, et cetera. And they say, well, there's nothing wrong. You're fine. Come back in six weeks or a year or whatever. And that's how many people get to my office, because they know that something is wrong. They don't care about what the lab work says, and they're looking crazy. And my thing is that now, who are you going to believe, the paper or look at the person? See, they don't look right. You've got to ask some questions. 
But, you know, at that point in your, uh, your evaluation, you don't have that kind of insight. That's what the instructing physician is supposed to bring to your mind. That even though this looks okay, let's look closer. The patient doesn't look right. There's just something about the color. There's just too much puffiness here. There's just something wrong. And it's better that you basically be cautious than to just dismiss it. But they didn't want to deal with none of that. That was ego tripping, and it was the whole thing about male, female, and just a whole bunch of other stuff that they was dealing with. And I didn't care because I was in control at that point, and nobody was going to be going out of there unless I saw them. So therefore, it was very interesting because the United Fund started sending over information to this, quote, indigent clinic that uh, talked about the fact that the research now has revealed that mothers taking vitamin pills can cause birth defects in certain people. They have found that too much vitamin D, too much calcium has caused bone deformities and some other things. So now, what does that mean? That means that now we have to go into what? Uh, informed consent modality. So therefore, that means that if this can cause some problems, the benefits will most likely outweigh the disadvantages. You need to still be informed of the disadvantages. So therefore, I'm telling the mothers now, yes, we have prenatal vitamins, but we have found that they can cause some birth defects, you know you have to understand that you might be one of the ones we don't know the chance is low but you need to be informed of that so they're like well i don't want that what else can we do well, i was like well you, you can eat a diet and we know that the amount of multiple mm -hmm. vitamins and things in the diet are not lethal if you follow a balanced diet and it was interesting because most of these young women prefer to actually eat a diet in my own department i couldn't find anybody to support me on that and this is another black woman, and she was telling me that, you know, she got her degree in dietetics from the university or whatever, and what I was talking about wasn't in her literature. And I'm like, well, you know, yes, I understand that. I said, but, you know, please just hear what I'm sharing with you. I said, because it is truly a nightmare to actually have somebody come in and, you know, status epilepticus that's having one seizure behind each other that's in labor, and they sitting up here eating their tongue off because somebody told them it was okay for them to have pork chops and Kool-Aid. And see, my thing is that I don't care how many grams of fat and how much protein they say is in a pork chop, it is not the best source of protein, and if we can just basically do something different, cannot we be creative? Oh, no, I just didn't want to hear none of that. So I'm like, well, fine, no problems, because I'm the head of the department here, so I'll see him myself, which is what I did. And so she sat in her office for a whole year and basically looked out the window. So I just saw them all myself and made the recommended nutritional changes. And it was very interesting, because then at that point, when the drug detail men would come in and load the closet up full of all these samples and things, and they open the door and that all stuff would fall down on their head, they was like, well, what happened? Y'all don't have no doctor here no more? <laughs> so now you have to understand it, because this is my own staff now. We're all black over here looking at each other. And they're like, oh, honey, we got that doctor. My name is Smith. Oh, that Dr. Smith, you know, she don't like none of that. She don't get none of that no more. She just give diet and yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the nurse. This is the nurse. Okay. <laughs> And, uh, of course, they're like, wow, well, what's the deal? So they are going to the head hospital now talking to the chairman of the department. So, of course, I get a telephone call asking me to come over to the main campus here to have an interview. And my thing is, you know, fine, no problem. So they're like, well, you know, we've just gotten a report that you're no longer giving prenatal vitamins. You know, and I'm like, right, you know, take a look at this information, of which in my waiting room there was no TV. There was lots of information for you to read, because you could look at TV at home. But here, you were going to get some information. You were going to get some information. And so I said, well, this is the kind of stuff that, you know, you all have been sending over here. And it says right here that multiple vitamins, prenatal vitamins, can cause birth defects. So I asked them, do they want to take them? Because now we're informing them that they have the possibility of having birth defects in the baby, and they say no. And so, like, they were shocked now because, see, you're not supposed to think. This is what I finally found out. By the time they finish with you as a physician, you are programmed to carry out programs. And you are not supposed to think unless you have permission to do research. Then it's okay for you to basically use your other brain cells. Okay? And so, therefore, it was astounding because they're like, oh, you know, she's thinking. So... I was like telling them that so what I do is just basically inform consent. We talk about it, the patient gives me what their opinion is, I document it in the chart.
patient says that they don't want the prenatal vitamins, I write down there the discussion of prenatal vitamins, its pros and cons were discussed. Patient has decided that she'd rather have a complete nutritional diet plan, and I sign off. And that's all legally that you are supposed to do. And their thing is, well, no, just give the vitamins. This is what I was told to do. Just give them. That was the response. I was just told just to give them. Okay, now you have to understand with the Europeans what that means. Okay, because I had to learn a while how to communicate with them. <laughs> oh no, because it's a real is issue with them about reading between the lines. So you have to understand when they say things, they're saying other things. Okay. And so I was like, oh, that's real interesting. So I had to get real clear on what I decided I wanted to do. Well, the, the whole medical profession is that the doctor is the guard and the patient obeys. No, no, no. That's what is set up for you to perceive. Yeah. The insurance company, the insurance company and the pharmaceutical company and the hospital is the god. The physician is a conduit to walk you through all that. Uh -huh, okay. And you've got to understand that. Okay, no, we just walk you through. Oh, except for break? Okay. No, we just walk you through that. So we just are supposed to be the gatekeeper to get you in, to get you dosed up, get you hospitalized, get your papers processed. But they run it. Okay, they run it. But they ego trip you if you don't pay attention to think that you're calling the shots. And they let you have little power things, but you're not. Okay, it's because when the hospital policies come through or when insurance companies tell you what they're going to pay for or when the new drugs come out that they tell you that you now have to basically use because we're doing a survey or experiment or whatever, oh, you got a right for that. So the way they got to turn that around is to teach people like us to take the power. Well, that's why I, you're here and that's why I'm here. <laughs> that's why I'm here. I don't let the doctor You know, and you have to understand that what I'm telling you is relative. I mean, because there are people in the system who are waking up like myself or about on their way out, okay? Uh, and there's some who obviously are supposed to be there and try to help you through it to the best that they can. Do you understand what I'm saying? But you have to understand that the general format is is that we basically w walk you through the system. That's what we do. We're not calling the shots. But the point being is this, is that what happened then is that after that year that I was there, what happened was the morti morbidity, morbidity and mortality rates of the mothers and babies fell to the same as the suburbs. Mm. And when that happened, they withdrew from the clinic. So they removed all their funds and things from the clinic and left the community because they weren't able to get and demonstrate enough pathology for that year while I was there to warrant them being granted the number of residents that they wanted. And so if they couldn't get the residents, then they have a need for the clinic. Hell, we only interested in you for pathology. And see, that was all retrospective for me because the reason why I resigned was because I was so disappointed in recognizing that we had an option here to give high quality health care and that my own nurses, et cetera, were into heavy sabotage. Because, you know, I was a young doctor at that time. All these were older women, et cetera. So I'm thinking that I'm really going to get this support because they're really going to really help me because they are really glad that we can all work here together. And it was like such an astounding shock to me to realize that these people were uh, more for supporting the uh, system knowing that it didn't make any changes. I mean, you've been sitting there for 20 years and seeing this same old mess cranked out and you see it don't make no changes. How do you continuously sit up and want to perpetuate it? You know, and it was just, I was just astounded because of my impression and indoctrination of older people from my family was that they were supportive, okay, and that they basically wanted to support you in succeeding, that they didn't work against you. So from what I had been indoctrinated with from my own family and then obviously because what the child does is carry the family model out into the world and when I saw that that was not really true and that all older people were not like my people that was devastating to me because I never saw these people as basic enemies but I had to realize that that's what it was because when they were telling me that you know why are you sitting up here talking to this girl you know she knows she's going to go out here and get pregnant again just give her these birth control pills well, I mean, if the girl is 11 years old, I mean, we realize she's got 40 years of reproducibility. You cannot have her swallowing birth control pills for 40 years without giving her a breast cancer, a liver cancer, whatever. 
why would I want to basically do that when I know what the sequela is? You can't take this for 40 years without these problems. So the issue here is not putting her on a birth control pill, but to try to find out why she was sexually active. Okay, but it was obviously a whole emotional issue. A lot of these women were not just out here like that had been alleged to get an ADC check. I thought that was astounding. <laughs> I was like, these girls don't know nothing about ADC at 11 years old. Where do you get that from? I mean, you know, they're out here just trying to feel loved, that somebody cares about them. Because they're latchkey kids, so the mama's at work, the daddy's not around, etc. And somebody's finally giving them some attention. So whatever the person is asking for is what they're going to give. Because they nobody gave no attention before, because they've always been talking about how I work so hard for you to give you this, that, and the other, and all you can do is whine about what you don't have. So that's what the parents are telling them. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, I mean, we have a whole issue here that this woman is acting on, and now she's wild pregnant, and she's just totally astounded. I mean, because this whole thing is a big shock, you know. So I'm saying that our birth control pill is not the problem, is not the solution for that. You know, but when you have your own people standing up saying that this is what you need to do because of X, Y, and Z, now see, we got some issues to deal with, and this is how we've been handled. So it's just been assumed that we are just basically going to screw, and that we can't be taught nothing, and we're not going to be responsible, so, you know, the best thing is to control them, and that's basically what's said, control them, so shove this stuff up their arm. Do you understand what I'm saying? We got this other pill that if they do want abortions now, we don't have to have them in the hospital or whatever. Just give them this pill, the things coming out of France and whatever else, and move on. And my thing is that, from an instance, I guess that would probably be the proper observation and conclusion based on economics. So it's not an issue, again, that can be solved from an institutional perspective. It's like you can't expect an institution to basically give love and attention and self-esteem to something that they can't get from home. Okay, and when there is proper interaction between men and women at home and the children are then bestowed on that, they're not interested in sex. I mean, because all of their emotional stuff has already been gratified. So, you know, when women have healthy relationships with their fathers, et cetera, they're not interested in jumping in the bed with folks. That is like real low on their list until they meet a special person that's more attractive to them than their fathers. Now then we have another component thrown in because now when we have fathers who are having sex with their daughters, now see, that's a whole other thing that we have to deal with. So see, you know, it's been really, really interesting for me to sit and hear and see these things all day long and begin to realize that, you know, this is something that we all are going to have to be aware of exists and stop acting like we're blind, which is not coincidental that we're sitting up here with so many problems with glaucoma and cataracts. Mm. Because as I said the other night, this is actually on a spiritual level, refusal for the individual to want to see. You know, so we don't want to see and deal with the issues in our homes. We want to deal with the stuff that we have not basically dealt with within ourselves. And see, when we talk about dealing with real medicine and real healing, see, we have to go to the soul level here, the emotional level, and deal with this. And most of my colleagues, as I was at a convention just like long ago, you and them, and they were talking about depression. And I really wanted to see how the European was going to treat this. So we sat down there, and the European said, yes, well, we have patients that come in that are depressed, and obviously he wants to tell you that he's not doing well with his wife, that his teenage son is giving him problems, and he's not doing well on his job. Well, hell, I just had an argument with my own wife, and, you know, I don't like how my business is going, so I'm not even interested in hearing his stuff, so this is what you do. And he immediately went through a whole repertoire of the pills that you recommend. So if they we talk about they can't sleep, then this is what you give them. If they say they're too jittery and nervous, this is what you give them, whatever. But he made it clear to us as his colleagues that he ain't even going to go in the room and ask you nothing about your home life and family structure because he ain't even dealt with his. So this is why I'm telling you that when I look at this new health plan that they're coming out with, it's a farce for the simple fact is that physicians have not even set up a support system to keep themselves healthy. So when a doctor comes to me and tells me he can't handle your stuff because his own life is kicking his butt, now how do you think you're going to be treated? <laughs> he is not going to ask you that because he can't even deal with his stuff. Because he doesn't know how. He's not, he but you have to understand that physician heal thyself. So you have to understand that looking at your own patients,
there's no difference between you and them except you might know something over here but you understand that unless you have a support system you're going to be just like them and this is what happens it's amazing my colleagues drop down with the same diseases just like who they treat so it's like when do we begin to realize that we have to have support systems to maintain quality so anytime you have a whole system that won't even consent to even let you know if they have AIDS, I mean, you know, I'm just miffed at the fact that the general public is still sitting up here not requiring that everybody in the hospital before we even go up in here again is going to have to be tested for AIDS. I mean, and that shouldn't even be any astute thing. <laughs> so my thing is that, no, you are, n I'm not going to the hospital no more. Nobody's drawing no blood or nothing else until you set up a board where everybody got to submit their blood to make sure they no longer have AIDS. We shouldn't have to worry about how many people are going to come down with AIDS the next three or four years because Dr. So-and-so treated them. Because there should be a standard where all the doctors are, are accountable. There should be a standard where all the teachers are accountable. There should be a standard for this, but you have to understand that if you don't think enough of yourself to basically have that, then you get anything. And so here you are laying up here in the house. You don't know who's treating you, what they breathe in, snorting over you, etc. but you should. <laughs> You know, I'm told to shut up. <laughs> okay. Now, okay, a couple people have asked me about uh, the blood. And that's like very, very interesting. But truly the blood is the uh, key to physical life. And we need to really get a real grip on its sacredness and what it does, okay? The red blood cell, which is what we have here, RBC is a red blood cell, is actually the mother cell for all tissues of the body. And you must understand that. Okay, the red blood cell is considered the toady potential cell of the body, and it has the capacity to transform into any other tissue. Now, it's really interesting because in Western medicine, we're not taught that. Okay, what we're taught is that there's a process known as mitosis and meiosis, and that you're born with these different types of cells, a liver cell, a kidney cell, a brain cell, or whatever, and that these organs okay, which is a collection of these cells working together simultaneously, some of these tissues and organs have the capacity to regenerate themselves, others do not, okay? Some nerve cells can regenerate very slowly, but usually not. Stomach, intestines, <coughs> mucous membranes, liver can regenerate relatively fast. Okay, this is what we're taught. So we're taught that if any of these organs get sick, then what you have to do is give it a medication. And once the medication gets in there, for whatever reason, miraculously, these tissues are now going to be straightened out if you give the right medication. Okay. That is really a fairyland tale that supports the pharmaceutical companies and has lots of sequela for the patient. Okay. What is so interesting here and so wonderful is, is that the red blood cell has memory because initially they do have nuclei and depending upon what the red blood cell is to become determines what memory it's going to have about itself and what it's going to do. The blood as it has been documented and demonstrated by two Japanese physicians and researchers, a Dr. Shishima and a Dr. Morishita, did 15 years of research to prove that all tissue in the human body is actually made from red blood cells, which is totally opposite of the Western philosophy. What they did is that they first of all analyzed the whole theory from which this idea that red blood cells were made from the bone marrow of the body. And there's a gentleman by the name of Verkow who decided that he wanted to know where blood originated from. 
So he took some pigeons and fasted them. Now you have to understand that a pigeon's metabolism is extremely rapid and they have to eat almost 90% of their waking time to sustain their metabolism every day. So he fasted these pigeons for approximately 11 days and then sacrificed them and then did autopsies on them to find out where he could see the red blood cells being made from. And so when he cracked their bones open, the long bones of their bodies, and looked at the tissue with the microscope, he discovered that there were little blood cells being made in the bone marrow of these pigeons. And so therefore he concluded that red blood cells were made from the bone marrow in the long bones of the body and supposedly therefore research from Auschwitz because they did a lot of research on the Jews in the concentration camps etc were to verify that. Now Dr. Shishima Morishita verified that red blood cells were made directly from the food you eat in the base of the villus of the small intestines. So here we have what the small intestines look like microscopically. They actually look like little fingers. And what we're looking at here is the lumen. This is where the little food particles, once you've chewed them up and the digestive enzymes have worked on them, actually now brush up against and come in contact with these little finger projections that line your intestines, the small intestines. There's a process kind of known as what we call penocytosis where once this food particle comes in contact with this mucous membrane, it actually fuses with the membrane and then is allowed to actually go into the cell. The cell then takes it with this little microscopic factory, breaks the nutrients down and actually transforms this into a red blood cell. Now at the base of the villus of the small intestines is all of these Enteric. arteries, veins, and lymphatics. And these red blood cells then are actually excreted from the base of the small intestines and released into the arterial system where they are then taken to the spleen through the mesenteric circulation. Now Western medicine still has some real issues about what the spleen does. So they understand it does some basic things like, you know, help to make uh, thrombocytes and blood clots and it helps to have some kind of effect on the white blood cells for immune function, etc. But they're really not clear yet, they say on what the spleen does. But the spleen is very interesting because it is actually the distributor of the body. That is to say that every organ in your body communicates with each other organ through a chemical identity and also through neurologic interaction. So every chemical secretes, excuse me, every organ secretes certain chemicals that identify itself. And the amount of the chemical the duration of the chemical, etc., is monitored by the spleen. And that actually tells the spleen the need that the organ may or may not have to have itself renewed. So the spleen determines, first of all, the amount of blood components that are to maintain the circulation. Because what Dr. Shishima and Morishita found out is that the most important organ system of the body is the circulation. Because if you have circulation, you can regenerate any part of the body. You lose the circulation, then wherever the circulation doesn't go, you have death. So therefore, the first system of the highest priority is the circulatory system. Now there are some real interesting observations that happened about 22 years ago in Ireland when those gentlemen fasted to death uh, because of the IRA issue. So what happened is that when they did the autopsies on these gentlemen that fasted 70 days, that they opened them up and they had no organs, mm. but they had complete total blood volume capacity. Now these people had went on a fast where they weren't drinking any water, they weren't eating anything. So the question was, well how do they have a complete total blood volume but no organs? And again, it's just proof to indicate that the circulatory system being the most important organ, that because the red blood cell has a capacity to transform itself into any other tissue, has what we call a back pathway.
And so if it happens that the circulatory system needs to be replenished for whatever reason, the organs of least importance will actually give up of themselves to allow their tissue to transform itself back into red blood cells to sustain the circulation. So that's what Mr. Verkow was seeing when he sacrificed the pigeons. That because these birds had been put into a fasting state and there was no nutrients going in through the front pathway through eating, then the body automatically said, we have to maintain the circulation. So therefore, the tissues of least importance are now going to return back to their original state, which is red blood cells. So in healthy individuals and in healthy animals, there is only fat in the inside of the long bones of the body. There's not blood or hemopoietic components. So it's very interesting because when we start seeing a transformation of the fat cells in the bone marrow of animals, be they humans, etc., being formed, what that is telling us is that the digestive tract has become so damaged that it is not able to absorb nutrients from the external environment and to allow the villus of the small intestines to make blood at the rate necessary for the demands of the body. So when we start seeing an individual having blood made, uh, blood hemopoietic components made in the bone marrow, they have had long-term digestive problems. And now the fat cells that are normally inside the bone marrow have to continuously go through a regression state back to a red blood cell to be used by the circulatory system or the spleen to replenish tissues that normally cannot be made directly from blood from the food you eat because the digestive tract has been hampered. So I think it's very interesting that with the onset of poor dentition, negligent dental care, habits like gum chewing, stress, not eating balanced foods properly, persistent constipation, inappropriate cooking habits, and therefore problems with chronic absorption and gas formation, etc., that most people have lost adequate absorption of nutrients to sustain a front pathway of making blood. So the Ponce de Leon fountain of youth is your small intestines. Because if you can actually find out what to eat properly and absorb it all, you will always be able to renew your tissues every 24 hours. So as more people have problems with their digestive tract because of negligence with chewing, dentition, improper eating, etc., know that you have to age. You must. Because you're not going to be able to make new tissue at the rate necessary. And there's going to be an imbalance here. So it's interesting. In oriental medicine, that's one of the things that they teach. You know, is that whoever has their teeth can have life forever. Or a real good facsimile. Because if you can masticate your food and your digestive tract is functioning relatively stable, you can be here. And it's interesting, as I understand, that's one of the indications that the Anutes, which are the Eskimos, use to determine whether they are going to commit hairy carry or not. Okay, that is to say that when they lose their teeth and their capacity to eat for themselves, they just go outdoors and freeze to death. Mm -hmm. Okay, because they feel that it's an insult for the children to have to chew their food for them. Because, see, their diet is, you know, 100% flesh and fat. You know, you don't eat vegeta vegetables in the Antarctic. Okay, so... This was very interesting research because when um, Dr. Shishima presented all this research and microscopically demonstrated the metamorphosis of these red blood cells moving into transforming themselves into organ tissue, I mean, it was just totally unheard of, unrevolutionary, and basically they did not give him his PhD for 10 years because before they would give him his PhD, they had to verify what he presented as his thesis was correct because it totally totally destroys 
the whole basis of which we prescribe medication, how we look at the body, etc. And still, Western medicine will not acknowledge this. Because you have to understand what it says. See, because if it says that whatever you eat is immediately formed into blood cells, then that means that if I prescribe a medication for you and you absorb it, you've already been treated to some measure just by taking one pill. So that means that then relative to the turnover rate of the red blood cell, which if they're relatively stable is 127 days, for you to have adequate saturation, I can actually dose you on one day and based on the turnover rate, et cetera, you've been treated for four months. So then how do I rationalize and prescribe for you to take medicine indefinitely of five or six times a day here forever? So see, that whole stuff was actually cut out of the whole teachings of how to teach a, a physician how to prescribe. You can't know that because, you know, that means that, you know, I won't make not even one-tenth of the money that I'm making off you taking all this medication. And then when I started studying astrology and realized that everything has a state of reactivity and inactivity, everything, okay, and that the active ingredients in this medication also has a timetable when it's more reactive than it's not at other times. So therefore, if I'm really supposed to treat you, then I should be prescribing and recommending that you take the dosage at the time that the ingredients are most reactive, which is only a certain time of the day every 24 hours. So when I'm telling you to drop stuff three or four or five times a day or whatever the situation might be any time you want to, that also is actually against the real reality of how the laws work with matter. So I was like, wow, that's real interesting because they never taught us that either. Even though a lot of my old books said that a physician could not prescribe unless he or she knew astrology. So I'm like, hmm, this is like real interesting. Okay? So this means that, you know, if you're not doing the research, et cetera, you really set yourself up to do a lot of harm to people as a physician. And it's karma for that because the universe don't care whether you knew or not because you could have found out. Okay? And that's the whole attitude that, you know, then that's why they had that whole scene in Egypt, you know, with um, Anubis, you know, and mm -hmm. my on the scales. <laughs> it's like, you know, you could have known depending upon the quality of your heart, so we don't have no excuses here. You know, when you have to basically face yourself and look at all the stuff that you've done, because you could have asked for the truth. You know, so that's why they talk about that your heart has to be as light as a feather. Right, because you have to basically come knowing that everything that you've done, you really basically ask for truth in your reasons for doing it relative to you so that there is actually no karmic weight. And see, now this gets real interesting because, see, negativity does precipitate matter. It's not coincidental that they talk about where it's real negative is dark and dank and old because it actually does precipitate matter. It actually precipitates. Negativity is actually a reality. It's the physical, dusty, granular, entity that will cover everything. It will actually smother the life out of everything. So it's like really interesting. So when it gets really heavy, it does actually precipitate and take on actually a physical manifestation, just negativity. But the point being here then is this. So that means then that now we really are looking at accountability here. Because everything you put in your mouth, as long as you're absorbing something, is going to actually turn into blood which is then going to be discerned by the spleen, and then the spleen is going to tag it so that it can become organ tissue. Okay. Now, what is so interesting is the fact that once the, these cells have been tagged, and I have a little cell here that has a star. This is a red blood cell, and it has a little star in it to indicate that it's a dedicated red blood cell. What that means is, is that the spleen has gotten the chemical information that the brain needs 300,000 new cells. And so once the circulatory system has been satisfied, the criteria and all the other things, then these baby blood cells will actually be tagged with the chemical indicative of the brain. And they'll be let back out into the circulation and they'll go through the whole trip of going through the body. And when they get to the brain, they will actually stay there because their chemical identity will cause them to sequester in that tissue. Now it's really interesting because everything has intelligence. And so even our little cells here, red blood cells, are bound by the pyramid of the mind. Because 
when they sequester in the brain tissue, even though they come in as little red blood cells, just by being in that environment, they will actually be nurtured and they will actually metamorph into brain tissue themselves and then actually continue on in that function. That is how you actually continuously are able to renew your tissues. So now, again, if we refer back to the pyramid of the mind, if, for example, the blood cell has been made out of inferior quality food, Hostess Twinkies, <laughs> Okay, Darvacet, Fago Pop, Coca-Cola, etc. Then that is going to actually be the ultrastructure under which this blood cell is supposed to be able to have to function. So if that happens to be tagged as a brain cell, then is it going to be able to tolerate the activities in the high energy environment of the brain with that kind of ultrastructure? And the answer is no. So these red blood cells do not have the durability and the strength and the pliability and the electromagnetic conductive capacity of blood cells that are made out of food that contains life force energy and has a more biological structure similar to your own. Because you have to understand that, you know, a host of Twinkies and Coca-Cola and all this stuff is man-made. It is not natural to this dimension. If you cannot basically get it off of a bush, a tree, or break it off of a plant, dip it out of the ocean, it is not natural. It's been modified by man intelligence, which means that it most likely has lost its life force carrying capacity. So that goes definitely for all soda pops and beverages. All that stuff is totally inert. If we're eating flesh, the rule is that it cannot be older than 72 hours or it totally has lost all life force energy. I mean, you know, and the doctors know that. If you can get your finger or arm to them or toe that's been amputated in 72 hours, they can most likely get it sewn on and it'll take. But after 72 hours, they can't use the tissue anymore because there's no life force energy left in it. So to eat a chicken that's five, six, seven months old, frozen, two years, meat that's molded for six or seven months. I guess they call those Delmonico steaks or whatever. <laughs> you have to be accountable for why, what you're eating and why. Okay, because it's an energy equation that you're balancing. No energy in, you definitely take energy out. Okay, energy in, then that means that you can build and you can store energy, but you don't lose. And it's just that simple equation. So, you know, it amazes me. I was someplace and I needed to use a telephone and I went into this restaurant, you know, and they the typical European restaurant. And it was just interesting seeing all those people, you know, eating all this flesh and it had all kind of things on it and they were all wrinkled. And it was like interesting because it's like their face was almost like candle wax, you know, and that it had like melted, you know, and it's like as they were eating the stuff in their plate, it was like their face was actually just falling off into it. It was like really strange what I was seeing as I was standing there just watching them eat all the stuff. And I was like, you know, wow, don't they see themselves? I mean, don't they see there's a direct correlation between how they can, you know, look at themselves when they were 21 and look at actually what they're putting in their body and then look at the mirror and actually see all this is actually just falling off the bone. They don't seem to make the correlation that there's a direct relationship between what they're putting in their bodies, which is death, and what they're actually seeing transform on their face. It's just basic, basic balancing of energy. That's all it is. So this gentleman, um, and I'm going to stop referring to him as this gentleman. I really got to get his name. It's kind of difficult to pronounce because it's a Russian name. But he was given the Nobel Prize three years ago for proving that mammalian tissue never ages as long as the internal and external environment remains constant. So he kept a couple of hearts alive for about 20 years and just pulled the plug. Because as long as he changed the solutions and things they was in, they always conducted the same amount of electrical energy, etc. 
never ever lost his strength, never became weak or anything. So I'm like, oh, okay, good, you know, and people still aren't getting it. So they do not understand that their external environment needs to be of a certain quality and type that continues to energize themselves and the internal environment. And your major internal environment is based on your consciousness because the consciousness determines what you're going to eat. So how you feel about yourself, how you feel about others, determines your entire behavior of what you're going to make the body do. And that's going to determine the internal environment. So when those things are all geared toward having life force energy and the external environment allows you to have life force energy, that is you have clean air, sunlight, okay, proper water, etc., there's no aging process. So when we talk about immortality, etc., I mean, it's a real reality. It's not anything fantastic at all, and especially when you understand this. So what happens is, is that what we're seeing then is when individuals are not able to absorb the nutrients or the quality of blood that they're making is just of a poor quality, then the tissues of least importance are actually reactivated to return back to being red blood cells to sustain the circulatory system. So now Africans really have uh, some special qualities on board that we even recognize in our abuse cause us not to age as rapidly as other races who have less melanin. Okay, and so why, what is this attribute of melanin that causes us not to age so rapidly? And it's wonderful because it is a whole bunch of things. One of the main attributes is, is that it is actually a uh, superconductor. Okay, and if anybody knows anything about superconductivity, they know that this is a energy resonance source that once exposed to a pure form of energy can actually capture that energy, multiply that energy, and actually store it. And then remanufacture it on its own without having to be exposed to any other energy source. And that's what melanin does. It is actually the first and original superconductor. So therefore that means that, you know, food now moves to a different level because it just doesn't have to be energy that's captured in the packaging of some other plant. That food for now can become any pure energy source. So whether that becomes sound waves in the form of music or whether it becomes color from being projected through clothing or through looking upon nature whether it is actually energy from touch, energy being directly related from, uh, relayed from one person to another, or from being exposed to the sun, etc. We have all these different avenues of being able to capture energy, which is then stored in the melanin and directly relayed through our nervous system to all of the other organs in the body, which is, becomes phenomenal. Because now, you know, we have other means of taking in nutrition, because that's the goal for all nutrition, is to be able to obtain, absorb, and to utilize enough energy to replace the energy used for metabolic processes on a day-to-day -day basis. So the blacker you are, the greater capacity that you have to absorb all these different forms of energy, which is all life force energy, and to store it and to even make more of it which is incredible. So that means that the melanated person has to really be into heavy self-undoing, okay, to bring about aging and finding death of themselves. So when you understand that, then you understand how we've been able to exist under the circumstances that we've existed under and still be here. Because we just have so much energy on board, it's really difficult to dissipate this. You know, when we're so busy dissipating it at the rate that we're not taking in anything, hardly, that we bring about our own death, it's phenomenal, because we have all these things going for us. It's incredible. So, you know, I had to really try to figure out, well, what is this real need of self-undoing that we have? 
and again the highest form and of energy that is available on the planet is actually love and whether we know it or not all these different forms of energy are actually different manifestations of that and everything in our environment is actually based on the culmination of what that energy is really about so it can be generated by thinking about it by being able to see oneself in other things etc and so when we get real busy involving ourselves in what I call withholding activities not seeing others as ourselves or being willing to treat others as we treat ourselves etc then this is when we actually break down the superconductivity of the melanin and it actually becomes a, a, a problem for us now I have a lot of things in here written on melanin about how it basically uh, is made at night in the melanocytes from melanin stimulating hormone because of the activation of the pineal gland that when the pineal gland is not exposed to light because the eyes are closed okay that it goes into making something known as um, melatonin as opposed to serotonin which is made in the daytime now let me just bring you into the awareness of the fact that there is something known as universal time based on our sun and our solar system and sunrise to sunset triggers the body to be in a certain mode of activity and sunset to sunrise then triggers the body to move into another so we have found that with the excretion of serotonin which occurs when the pineal gland based on the fact that the eyes are open taking in light causes the cells of the body to want to increase their metabolism and to throw off waste so the daytime cycle is actually a detoxification nutrient acquiring activity for the body so therefore people who don't eat during the daytime cause some serious problems for their body because it's in the daytime that the body wants nutrients to be put on board to extract the nutrients to basically hold them and store them in excess of what needs to be done during the daytime as far as detoxification for the nighttime cycle so starting at sunset by sun time not by your folks European time or Greenwich Village time whatever that meant is okay the body then wants to go into a whole different mode of regeneration and if the eyes are allowed to close along with the sun diminishing or the light diminishing on the surface of the planet then the pineal gland will stop making serotonin and begin to make melatonin or melanin stimulating hormone and melanin stimulating hormone then works on the sacred pyramid in the brain which we talk about in Egypt because then the anterior and posterior pituitary gland then becomes activated to start making something known as growth hormone and a person's longevity and youthfulness is dependent upon how much growth hormone you're able to make at night time you don't make any growth hormone you're going to be out of here real fast and that's why these little kids that look like they're 100 years old and seven they don't make growth hormone so they age and they out of here by the time they 10 but they look like 700 when they leave here at 10. this is something in canada's common in europeans what's there that prophoria or some something some strange thing progeria right okay so the longer you're able to make high levels of growth hormone then the growth hormone causes all the tissues at nighttime to start regenerating so that this cycle that I talked about about the blood basically primarily goes on at nighttime because that way you're supposed to be resting and you're not active and your breathing rate has gone down heart rate has gone down so therefore energies are minimal for basic maintenance and all the energies otherwise are usurped for reconstruction so now when you get busy and decide that you want to work all night and you want to work all day or you want to party all night and you want to sleep all day then you have to pay the cost okay because that is not how the body is structured and this is very devastating for 
people with melanin because your immunity is definitely related to the amount of growth hormone and melanated stimulating hormone that you can make. And this has been so interesting in observing uh, what AIDS is doing in Africa. Because again, based on uh, Eurocentric chemistry, with the amount of AIDS that uh, has been inoculated in Africans, they are just too shocked that they have not been able to go in there over five, ten years ago and kick the bodies to the side and take over. I mean, they're like, we don't understand it because we know we gave you a whopping dose. <laughs> we do not understand why you're still dragging around here yet. We are just really perplexed. But see, I understand it because, see, they forgot about that sun mm -hmm. and that melanin. Okay? And the sunlight, again, is a natural form of food for us. And with the melanin still functioning as a superconductor, crippled, but it's still functioning, okay, mm -hmm. they are still able to generate enough energy that their rate of deterioration totally has thrown their calculations off. Now, you know, again, they've been messing with the food chain over in Africa for a long time, which again messes up the front pathway for regeneration because they're getting imbalanced nutrients. And then, you know, the mother's over there giving uh, animal milk or something over there instead of what they should be eating. Everybody's living off corn and nothing else. And that causes right away B vitamin deficiencies and some other things that it's still not being able to balance out. But the people could get a balanced diet, okay, and could basically get a, some support and shift in some consciousness, it would be like there was no AIDS virus at all in Africa. Because of this phenomenon known as melanin. And these are just, just a few of the things that we actually know about it. Because again, you know, we haven't uh, paid to do any investigation on ourselves to really spend the time and uh, the effort on understanding what it's about. But um, in the book, Vitamins and Minerals from A to Z, to really help us understand the importance of why full spectrum light is so important, why we have to be very careful about wearing synthetic fibers, why we have to be very aware of what we're doing in the nighttime hours. So you have to understand that if you're going to be up at night, you know, you need to be doing something that you know is going to pay off. Otherwise, it's very important that from the hours of 10 p.m. to 4 a.m., you should be asleep. Because that is when melanin-stimulating hormone peaks of pineal activity. for you to be able to regenerate. A.M. 10, 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. Uh-huh. No, they are doing it. That's how they are. Okay. And so that's what you're looking at when you look at the history of our uh, musicians. Okay, that most of them, unless they break that cycle, because they finally have been able to acquire some money where they don't have to do nightclub work, can't live basically over age 55. Mm -hmm. They're all dead by then. So, you know, if they tooting up, plunking, as my mother would say, all night long and haven't made no cash to be able to sit down and do some, just some weekend stuff, they're not here. Okay, because they are not making enough growth hormone with all the other abuses, usually of drugs and a whole bunch of other stuff, to be able to regenerate. And so the Duke and uh, Count Basie, you know, so they was able to hang in here because they were able to take a seat. Didn't have to be anybody who's working at night? Okay. Prim primarily, and especially if you're abusive, like the environments that they work in, a low oxygen tension because everybody's smoking cigarettes and, you know, the alcohol consumption. I mean, all this stuff uses up a tremendous amount of vitamins creates a lot of free radicals in the bloodstream, you know, and if you're not doing something to really deal with that, yeah, the body usually can't take it at that time. So truly, it ages you. And even this is really uh, the same cycle that happens in Europeans, but because, first of all, they have very little melanin, which actually cap to captures a lot of this uh, extra energy, and because their pineal glands 
in many cases, sometimes they're actually born with calcifications in the pineal gland. They just don't ever crank in as much high levels of growth hormone, period. So nighttime work is unnatural. It's really unnatural for us. But again, because we are the highest evolved beings on the planet, if you know the laws, you can do anything. So it kind of goes back to, you know, it's not what you do, it's how you do it. Okay, and we have tremendous reserve capacity. So, you know, my recommendation is that I tell people when they've been joined in uh, employment relationships that they understand that they get four months a year to work at night. So you want to work at night, you do a four-month shift, and you do not do that again until basically the next year. So that you can basically break even as far as what you're doing to your body. And so you have to understand then because if with the amount of Africans that we have, if we wanted to basically perpetuate something 24 hours, seven days a week, 52 weeks out of the year, we could easily do that because the numbers would allow us to do that. But it would just have to be an agreement that, you know, you only worked four months out of the year at nighttime. And because there's so many of us on the planet, I was saying that it's just a business as far as being able to have help for other businesses, because that's a European problem. They don't have enough of their own kind to man what they've created. See, this is a real problem for them. So it's a whole industry right there being able to provide skilled labor for them. We can make a lot of money just hiring ourselves out. But it's very dangerous for us to do that because we don't even know what we need to protect ourselves of work indefinitely. And one of the agreements, if I had that kind of business, would be is that, you know, if I'm going to contract my workers out to you, is that obviously they have to rotate. No worker of mine can be allowed to work more than four, hour, four uh, months out of the year. Okay? And if you can't go along with that, we can't let our people work for you. See, that's how you set that up. Our people need fresh air. You're not going to be serving them no meat, no synthetic problems on the, on the job. You understand know what I'm saying? The air conditioning, the whole circuit door is ventilation system has to be totally different for us. And when I've gone into these factories and looked at the type of ventilation that we work under, et cetera, it's phenomenal. I mean, it's like, you know, melanin is just incredible because they would have been dead a long time ago. They did a whole presentation on the condition of the uh, gold mines in South Africa. It's 110 degrees down there. Those people have to work 10 or 12 hours. And they only dig the mines to be three feet high. So those people are down there working with jackhammers on their knees for 10 hours. With very poor ventilation because it's a quarter of a mile down in the earth. Okay, and it's really interesting because the, the, the white overseer don't even go down there. So that's why they guard them so heavy. They strip them when they come out. Make sure they're not carrying the diamond mines, excuse me. They're not carrying any diamonds on them or anything. So they strip them when they come out and they strip them and check them when they come in. But the white boy don't even go down there because he can't take it. And he definitely does not have the capacity to be on his knees for nine to ten hours every day because it's only three feet high. And the commentator said that the reason why they don't make them six feet high so the men can stand up is because they didn't want to make the investment. And so you have to understand that you have a problem when you basically are going to stay on your knees for 10 hours a day in a place that's not ventilated. See, you, that's a personal issue. My thing is that, you know, that's fair game. Because if you don't think enough of yourself to demand to at least be able to stand up, I probably wouldn't invest in it either. That's just how the universe works. Okay, so we have to understand that, you know, we have serious issues of self-esteem, that you think that you got to go away from your family for six months at a time and live in a compound. I mean, it was heavy how they ran it, and that you got to be on your knees in some place that's only three feet high with a jackhammer at 110 degrees, and that you got to be strip searched going in and coming out and an ID card to go home. Well, now, hey, let's look at what you think about yourself. See, this is the position that we got to start taking with apartheid, because we have way too much innate ability to even tolerate that. So this is truly welcomed on one level. And see, that's real interesting, because we have to really deal with that. These are grown men and women that are tolerating this. These are not children. So as I continue to look at the conditions that we expose ourselves to and what we do and still realize that we are able to function at the level that we are, we are truly supermen and women. <coughs> 
So I didn't even recognize, for example, that uh, many of the Europeans had been taught as far as x-rays go, that they're supposed to actually turn up the intensity of the volume of x-ray for Africans because it needed more to penetrate our bones and tissues. And kind of in a way that's right because melanin does absorb a lot of that and neutralize it. That's one of the traits that it does. We do have 10 times the bone mass and eight times the muscle mass in Caucasians. So I could imagine that if you had a real low dose beam trying to get an x-ray of bone tissue that probably will come out real hazy and, and as we say, uh, underpenetrated. And these are just some of the things that we need to know. But in that we've taken a higher dose, are there other things that we need to do to neutralize them? <coughs> but this was most profound, and this came through for me. <coughs> because it explained a lot. You know, in, in Detroit, there's some billboards that some Europeans have leased. And on the billboards, they say, we're the solution. <laughs> Okay. And for whatever reason, I don't know if this was a trust company or insurance company or whatever, but that just really stuck in my mind. Okay, that they would basically advertise themselves as being the solution. Okay. But it's very interesting, however, because the question is that they're the solution for what? And see, and that's what we always have to like finish the sentences with. Because here we have a situation just based on melanin and understanding that melanin really is the physical manifestation of light in human beings. That's what it is. Okay? So the blacker you are, it actually is a reflection of how much of the complete light spectrum you actually are absorbing and holding on to. Which actually is determining the rate at which your atoms are vibrating. So when we're actually looking at the color of a person, we're really actually understanding what the frequency of movement of the atoms are of that individual. We're actually looking at their vibratory rate. Because as we talked about the fact, everything is in motion, regardless of whether our naked eye can see it or not. Everything vibrates. It has a vibratory rate. So this divining was actually given to me. And when I started reading Fred Allen Wolf's information, physically is calculated as appropriate. Is that the type of melanin in my book I talk about and uh, Carol Barnes talks about that there's basically six known types of melanin, all of which actually have a absorption rate of light that they interact with because it's actually showing what part of the melanin molecule is vibrating at that particular rate. That when we look at the four predominant races on this planet, we are actually looking at the capacity of the individual to interact with the full electromagnetic spectrum. So the blacker the person is, that means that they have the capacity to actually interact with the entire known electromagnetic spectrum. The fairer a person is, that means that their capacity to interact is limited to are uh, closer within the range of the visible spectrum. This is the visible spectrum, this very small square of of this line here. And we actually take it and mag actually contains the basic primary and secondary colors. Okay. Beyond this capacity the Caucasian claims that they can't see anything else. So what they're telling us is that they, their molecules vibrate between 700 to 400 nanometers per second. Okay? So therefore, if a person is actually vibrating at a higher rate or a lower rate than this, Europeans are not going to be able to actually actualize or understand what they're talking about because it's out of their capacity unless they use a transducer or an amplifier to perceive that frequency. So when we look at these little black boxes that Europeans create, they are amplifiers and transducers that capture higher or lower frequency vibrations of light and re reflect them back to them at a speed that they can acknowledge. So that's why they talked about it was impossible to basically see a picture in a box. Even though we always do that all the time, we see visions in our mind all the time. <coughs> this is part of our heritage. 
But they couldn't deal with that until actually they were actually able to make a transducer amplifier that could capture the frequency of TV waves and reflect it back to them in a box at the rate that they vibrated at. They were not able to do that until they could actually create a black box that captured radio waves and reflected back to them at a rate that they could vibrate at. They were not able to acknowledge UV or laser or x-ray, etc., until they were able to capture it and expose it to something that reflected it back at a rate that they vibrated at. So that means then that all the time they're talking about none of this other stuff existed until they were able to capture it in a box and then have it reflected back to them at a slower rate so that they could perceive it. So can you understand what that's saying about their awareness of what reality really is and can be? Okay, so they have always had a very limited awareness of complete reality because of their own innate vibratory rate. And so everybody who is actually enjoined with them, regardless of what race they are, and has agreed that only their reality is the reality, truly is also limited, living a very limited perspect perspective of reality. Now, that causes problems for all these other people here because they have to go into a state of denial at some point because as their melanin is able to pick up other information and other realities if they choose to discuss it or choose to try to relay it to Caucasians it will automatically be rejected and so you have to make a decision then whether you are crazy or whether you just will not discuss it or that you'll ignore it. You just have to do that because you're, they're not going to be able to basically see this and deal with your stuff word to word because they have to have an external manifestation of melanin to verify that what you are talking about is true. It's just that simple. So then how do you do that? Okay, I mean, so how do you basically live with these kind of people? So, you know, I think that Asians especially have done miraculously well. Okay, because what they do is they continue to honor themselves and live their reality. And then they say, well, fine, we have a market here. Because our market is the capacity to make these little transducers and amplifiers for them so they can continue to know what reality could be about. <laughs> and they just constantly sell them to them. And that's what they do with the little microchips. And they sell them all the little black boxes, the TVs and the radios and the microwaves. So they just make all the little external melanin manifestations for them. So they just make their little melanin for them. So the key here is then that obviously if a person is only able to innately vibrate at this rate and perceive this level of reality, and you have this capacity to, re re to perceive all of these other levels of reality, at a point in time, there is definitely going to be a divergence and a denial on whose reality exists. Okay, how do you handle that? Okay, and Africans have not done well because what they've decided to do is ignore their own reality, which means then that it totally then makes them dysfunctional because for them to function, they need to be able to honor all that they know that they can perceive to be able to use it to perform their function. So to only be willing to agree to see this level of reality totally denies your whole reason for being, which is why we then perceive ourselves as being totally dysfunctional and incapable, which is why we're in the state that we're in. So the only way that that can be changed is for people to start being truthful with themselves and dealing with their stuff. So I've had a lot of young people come to me and tell me about what Europeans call extrasensory perceptive experiences, okay, and mystical things and whatever else, etc. For us, that's everyday living. 
and that's every day our awareness. But now, because we are only relying on Europeans to be a description of what's real and what isn't, then now that forces us to not even discuss and deal with our stuff or think that we're crazy. So, you know, these are the issues that each and every one of us is now being asked to recognize. Because you have to understand that if you're thinking it, it's real. The key is, is that, you know, what is the responsibility that goes along with thinking thoughts like this and how does it actually feel in your body? Because the body being a wonderful vessel, already knowing what you're supposed to be doing, etc., because it is actually your tool, will let you know if the type of energies that you are entertaining in your mental body are appropriate to be processed through the physical realm. It's very simple. So if you're thinking thoughts that immediately bring you pain, then you have to ask yourself, why is this? Is it something I ain't got no business thinking? Or is it because I'm dealing with some fears or some issues? But moving beyond and asking your body what the issue is, it'll be revealed to you what it is. Because a lot of us basically have pain because we don't want to do the right thing. So you can have pain for some interesting reasons, but you have to always ask for further clarification. But I think this is very important. So that is to say then that obviously Caucasians in no way can be our solution because their capacity to perceive the potential realities in this dimension are quite limited. And if they give us a solution for an issue based on what they're able to perceive, for us it will always be inadequate. And you have to understand that. So what they give us is their opinion based on what they're able to perceive. And we can basically take that information and weigh it and see if it's applicable where we're willing to function. But it can never be a solution because their perceptive capacity is not adequate to deal with our level of reality, our level of accountability. And it's just very simple. And there's nothing offensive about it. It has nothing to do with inferior superiority. It just has something to do with perceptive capacity. And that's just it. Their purpose and what they were created for did not require them to have to have melanin. And that's just it. No, no problem. So therefore, we have something that they basically have very little of, but we have to honor it. And we have to work with the reality that it brings us into. We cannot continue to deny it. Okay, so that is to say then that obviously where we need to function and the reality that we need to own up to, we have to look to ourselves again, okay? They cannot basically deal with that for us because not until somebody actually makes a little box for them can they step into where we're functioning from. And we have to deal with that. I mean, lasers have always been here. Gamma rays have always been here. All this stuff's always been here, but to them it's been very brand it's new. It's just like not until they discovered a sextant could they get across the ocean because they thought it was flat. Even though that wasn't our reality, so what, we were supposed to not travel because they basically don't know how to get across the ocean? Of course not. That's ridiculous. Okay, and this is very, very important to understand because I'm not talking about superior or inferior. I'm just talking about a basic understanding of yourself that for you to be the best, you cannot continue to let someone else who has different chemical, physiological, neurologic perceptions determine your reality. Well, I'm saying that they might not be able to perceive any of it at all in this dimension. Because, see, you have to understand that if it's your function to help them perceive it, then how can they perceive it if that's what you're supposed to do? I mean, that's what you have to understand how important purpose is. Because the universe is incredible. Nature is one of the uh, greatest accountants I've ever seen in my life. Everything is accountable for and nothing is here in excess. So if you're supposed to do something, then basically there's not going to be a, a, a replication of that unless you abdicate your willingness to do it. Because the promise is that nobody's going to go without. 
See, that's, that's not even considered. So if you agree to be here to do certain things and you decide not to do it, a replacement will come. But there's not a competition with you to do what you're supposed to do as long as you're willing to do it. But understand that your agreement to do it, everything has already been laid out for you to have room and space and support to do that. And the longer you linger and refrain from not taking your proper place, the discomfort that is created for everybody else who's waiting for your gift, you feel because everything is reciprocal. So if you're supposed to basically create something that I need to finish my stuff with and my progress and you off somewhere messing around and I can't get what I need, you will actually feel that in your discomfort because you're not where you're supposed to be. Do you understand what I'm saying? And so I'm saying that when we're looking at the havoc in the world, it is partially because we're not functioning. There are solutions that are to be given that can only come through us. And so we're at a crossroads now because if we're unwilling to basically move into our own proper consciousness and function at the capacity that we're supposed to, we will be removed off the planet and those particular entities or whatever that now can feel the need will be here. And it's just, it's really that simple. So I'm saying that we cannot continue to play, you know, what's that little game, follow the somebody? We can't do that anymore. Okay, we definitely have to acknowledge our own stuff and move to it. Okay, and see there's no such thing about, you know, and this is why we have to be very careful about, you know, credentials and all that stuff, like, you know, the sister was saying, you know, whose credentials do they have? You know, well, you got a brain, it's your credentials, blockhead, I mean, literally. <laughs> I mean, you know, you can ask yourself, is this true for you or not? I mean, you don't need nobody else's credentials. Do you understand what I'm saying? To determine if this is what you need for you to be able to move in your own space. Okay, so we have to really stop playing that game. These are a lot of traps that we've fallen into. You know, the truth is the truth, and if a worm can call up to you and give you the info, are you going to have an uh, issue with it? You know, you could, but I wouldn't think it was real smart. Okay, this is what I'm saying, is that everything has the capacity to be a step of enlightenment for you if you're truly looking for the truth. You, all you have to do is just ask yourself, you're the credential. Does this fit my stuff? What I need? So this is very, very important, but we have to basically realize that our reality, our awareness, our intensity to interact with ourselves and each other and light puts us at a whole different rate of receptivity. And we cannot deny that. Now, we might not understand what we perceive, and then that just means that you just ask for more clarity. That's all. You don't have to walk around confused and perplexed. Because all answers to all questions that you haven't even thought about asking yet have been answered. That's the completeness of where we've come from. So when you realize that you're at an impasse, you need more information, you just ask. I need more information. I'm open and ready. Give it to me in the way I can understand it. And just continue to live. And I guarantee you, you will get your answers. And usually if you're 100% dedicated to having them revealed to you, usually depending upon your energies, you can get the information within 24 hours. Now see, this is, goes into some real interesting things here, and I'll just share this with you real quick, because I do want to wind up just, just briefly on these diseases. Is that, uh, you know, the Egyptian stuff was just so uh, incredible, okay. Oh good, okay. Is this what you have to remember? You and I, okay, universal laws embody in, that's a the, in the form of geometric images. Okay? 
So you have to understand that anytime you see anything that's round, you are actually looking at a universal law that actually governs that matter. If you look at anything that's linear, you're actually looking at a universal law that is governing that matter. You're looking at something that is pyramidal, you're looking at a universal law that is governing that matter. If you're looking at an interaction of both of those things, then we have two laws that are responsible for the coagulation of these protons in this time and space. Okay? When you're able to align yourself and understand the language of geometry, okay, then you actually become the law yourself. Now, this is a whole meditation and science that was dealt with in the temples in Egypt. All of these things are actually geometric, or should I say, universal laws. All of them are universal laws. And what happens is that there's a law of familiarity, that when something stays in your space long enough, it actually becomes a part of you. Okay? So it was interesting in Egypt because the people in the temples in Egypt actually were forced to actually become and align themselves with these universal laws because they did certain things. So it wasn't coincidental that certain things were made round and other things were made long and other things were intersected and crescent, etc. Because they're actually dealing with complete universal law in its physical embodiment. So there were special meditations that they did that they actually just focused on these geometric images for certain times of the day, for certain durations, until the energy that the law controlled, now they actually possessed. Because there was just a fusion. And there are actually certain <laughs> laws, like this, obviously, these are generators. Okay. Okay, and when people actually put themselves in pyramids, whether they focus on them or they put them in there, et cetera, what they're actually doing are generating energy. These are gen energy boosters, et cetera. These are uh, conduit connectors. This is able to link oneself from point A to point B in obviously two major directions. And it's interesting, for those people who are interested in communications and want to know information, this is actually the geometric form that you focus on. And when this and you actually become one, all you have to do is think anything, and the person who you're thinking about immediately resonates to that and will respond if you give them a command, or you will actually draw the information to you. The person will bring it, you will open the mail, whatever else, etc. It's just that simple. Because, see, the understanding was that you had to master this dimension in that you, first of all, had a physical body to be accountable to before you were allowed to actually go through the other realms of your reality. So you were not taken out of the physical body and gone into what the other names are, your car and all these other things, until you actually had mastered this. And the easiest way to do that was actually to deal with the geometric forms that govern that. So you have to understand that when you are actually looking at straight lines or there's things that are rectangular, or you're actually dealing with certain energies. And see, all of this is actually our original language, okay? So we always, always, always spoke in universal laws and truth. There was only one tongue. And that's why when you travel around the world, et cetera, you see these same forms over and over and over and over again. Because this was a universal language.